So we just landed here in Dublin Airport and welcome to Ireland everyone. Our journey has just begun. We'll start our journey from the most public entry point for the international visitors, the Dublin Airport. There's also ferries available from Ireland, United Kingdom and France. If you're from the European Union or from a major industrialized country including the good old USA, Canada, Australia and most of South America, good news, you can get it visa free with a nice Irish smile. This is really 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 not cool because Air Canada <laughs> lost my luggage. Um, oh my god. Despite not having my essential supply inventory of underwears, life goes on. And I can only hope for the best if I need to buy these. Definitely some cold hard cash is needed. The euro. The best way to grab some of these bling bling is the airport ATM. Most do not have a surcharge. Uh, you'll need some cash to get down to city center uh, as well. Uh, the cheapest is the public buses taking about 40 minutes to an hour. Available at Terminal 1 every 10 minutes during the rush hour and 30 minutes off peak. You don't need exact change for the fare. There's also express shuttles and private coaches every 15 minutes from 5 a.m. to midnight. Dublin is a capital of Ireland established by indigenous Gael population around 7th century AD and a historical and temporary center for education, the arts, administration, and industry. Today, the city has a rank on Alpha, which placed among the top 30 cities in the world with a population of 2 million in its metropolitan area, and also home to the famous Guinness beer. So let's get going and meet some Irish friends for a nice drink. There's a lot of ways to get around the city center. The best way is on foot. <laughs> it's free. We're gonna start our exploration on O'Connell Street, Dublin's main through fair. The street was widened in the late 1700s and renamed the Sackville Street until 1924, when it was renamed again in honor of Daniel O'Connell, a nationalist leader of the early 19th century. So we're gonna start our journey right here at the very city center of Dublin. Right behind me is the Spire of Dublin. It's a 120 meter spire that was commissioned in 1999 and completed in 2003. Now, the number one criticism about this structure is the fact that it's just a simple beam. It has absolutely no architectural connection to the city of Dublin, but it does look pretty interesting. So let's go and check it out. The bombing of the Nelson Pillar in 1966 left a gaping hole in O'Connell Street in the heart of the Dublin city centre. The pillar needed replacing, and the early proposal in the 1970s argued for the erection of a monument of Irish revolutionary and Easter Ring rising leader. The monument was commissioned as a part of the street layout redesign in 1999 after an international competition was launched. The first section was installed on 18th of September 2002 and consists of eight hollow stainless steel comb sections, the longest being 20 meters, which was installed on 21st of January 2003. The spire reached a total cost of 4 million euros, standing at an incredible 120 meters high, and without a doubt, the tallest structure in Dublin city centre, with a 3 meter wide base acting as the spire's foundation. The head of the spire is 15 centimeters wide and is lit by a small amount of LED. Despite what was originally believed, the spire is not self-cleaning and has to be cleaned every 18 months. The cleaning costs around uh, 120 euros. Oh, I mean, uh, <laughs> 120,000 euros. That's a lot of burgers and fries. But thank goodness, <laughs> a nice postcard with the postage doesn't cost 120,000 euros. You can get it right across at the General Post Office. This is one of the Ireland's most famous buildings, not least because it served as the headquarters of the leader of the Easter Rising. As a result, the building was destroyed by fire in course of the rebellion and not rebuilt until 1929 by the Irish Free State Government. It was one of the last great Georgian public buildings erected in the capital. The foundation stone of the building which was designed by Francis Johnston was laid by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland on 12th of August 1814. 
For those of you who think you're smart, the perfect place to pick up a postgraduate degree is Trinity College Dublin. This is one of the seven ancient universities of Britain and Ireland, and Ireland's oldest and most prestigious surviving university. Getting in here, <laughs> it's tough, but I hope picking up hot chicks here is a little easier since according to my research, women were admitted to Trinity College as full members since 1904. First established outside the wall of Dublin, in part to consolidate the rule out to the monarchy in Ireland. As a result, the university was a Protestant ascendancy for much of its history, but professorship, fellowship, and scholarship were reserved for Protestants until the restriction was lifted by the Act of Parliament in 1873. Today, Trinity College is the only Irish university in the League of European Research Universities and routinely ranked as one of the top 100 universities in the world. Being a student means you're always going to be hungry <laughs> and definitely need some sugar to hit the books. Uh, not surprisingly, a quick bite on a budget sounds just fine to me. 3 euro cheap eats off for our pizza uh, or 5 euros for our Indian food combo but uh, I'd settle for something healthier. Maybe not. Now Ireland is one of the more expensive places here in the EU but uh, what you can save money on food is go to Tesco and get one of their meal deals. They are 4 euros to get a sandwich, a snack and of course orange juice, vitamin C. That being said, let's, let's eat. After refueling, I headed over to the Leicester House, Ireland's parliament. I got a lot of energy for a political bloodbath. And sadly, it's close to foreigners. But don't worry, uh, there's a similar looking building next door that is a little bit more open. I mean, a lot more open, uh, even to Asian kids like me. And it's free. So welcome to the National Gallery of Ireland and get ready to see lots of naked statues. Okay, just joking. The National Gallery of Ireland was founded in 1854 and it has the most extensive collection of representative of Irish art, uh, paintings in particular. And its most notable is the Dutch masters and Italian bronze. When the gallery opened, it only had 112 paintings, but today it boasts over 2,500 and approximately 10,000 other works in different media, including watercolors, drawings, prints, and sculptures. Every major European school of paintings is extensively represented. It has also housed a renowned collection of Irish paintings, the majority of which are on permanent display, including one of the most rare and famous Caravaggio 1602 paintings, The Taking of Christ, depicting the arrest of Jesus during the Judas identifying Christ with a kiss when the guard moved in for the arrest. So the painting behind me is the most famous painting here in the gallery and it was missing for 200 years. The recent Millennium Wing was opened in 2002 and unlike previous two extensions, this new wing has a street frontage and considered modern. In line with the Brutus style, the interior concrete walls are still unsealed maintaining a quite modern look to the wing. For those of you who are interested in the evolution or wanting to find out why some guys' brains are not so developed, like uh, US President Donald Trump, <laughs> good news, the dead zoo is around the corner. And by the way, that's a nickname for the National History Branch of the National Museum of Ireland. 
Now that Natural History Museum here in Dublin is also referred to as the Dead Museum. It's also the museum of the museums considered by many because it contains over 10,000 specimens from all over the globe. Now, even though this museum was built in 1856, um, created, uh, its route can be traced back to 1786. The museum was built in 1856 for the part of the collection of the Loyal Dublin Society, and the building and the collection was later transferred to the state. In 1792, the Society purchased the collection of Nathaniel Goffrey Lithwick, one of the Europe's largest natural history collections. The collection had expanded continuously since its establishment. Today, the natural history collection comprises over 2 million items in the field of zoology and geology, and a million of specimen being insects. There is also previously a botanical collection, but this was transferred over to the National Botanical Garden in the 1970s. The museum building is a cabin style, designed to showcase a wide-ranging and comprehensive zoological collection, and has changed little over a century. The ground floor contains mammals from all over the world, including extinct or endangered species. And the same floor also includes an Irish room, which includes a display of Irish animals, noticeably silver mounted skeletons and giant Irish deers. Hopefully, <laughs> I won't end up being a showpiece here anytime soon. Another important museum is located in an adjacent building, the home of the archaeological branch of the National Museum of Ireland. This is a must-go place for those of you who are interested in learning about the history of Ireland. Many important artifacts from the museum were named in Irish Times Ireland's 100 Most Important Historical Objects. The Museum of Archaeology covers both uh, Irish and other antiquities. Now, in general, it focuses mainly on Stone Ages up to the Middle Ages. The museum also features display on prehistoric Ireland, including Bronze Age work in gold, as well as early medieval church treasure of Celtic art and Viking Ireland. There are special displays of Ireland from ancient Egypt, Cyprus, and the Roman world and special exhibitions are regularly mounted. <laughs> if you want some ideas for your next wedding ring, you will find out the central area of the museum, which contains one of the finest collection of Bronze Age gold objects in Europe. The gold work range in dates between 220 BC to 500 BC, most of them being jewelry, but with many objects being possibly used for ritual functions. If you have enough of museums, don't worry. You can always get a fresh breath of air with lots and lots of greens free. The best of all, you won't need to walk that far at the Marion Square Park. Now the square here was first laid out in 1762 and was largely completed by the early 19th centuries. And this is actually one of the finest surviving squares here in the city of Dublin. And it's very historic because it's right in front of the government house and surround it with the National Gallery and the National Museum. The square was laid out after 1762 and was largely completed in the beginning of 19th century. The plan of the park included a double line of trees around the perimeters, which is later enclosed by a railing. Up until 1960s, the park was only open to the resident in possession of a private key. The square is also home to the National Memorial and the Centennial Flame to honor the member of the Defense Forces who died in service of the state. No 
less than 500 meters away is home to another historical park dating back to 1880s when the Lord Arden publicly opened a 22-acre space for the citizen of Dublin. The St. Stephen's Green has been maintained in its original Victorian layout with 750 trees along with 3.5 kilometers of accessible pathways, 15 commemorative sculptures located throughout the park, Victorian Swiss shelters in case uh, uh, you need to shelter from the rain, and a waterfall. There's even free lunchtime concerts during the summer month that is. By the way, there is also a children's playground, so have lots of children and bring them here. Once again, it's free. For places that's further away, you can grab a visitor's transit pass for unlimited travel on Dublin's public transportation for one, three, or seven days. These cars are sold at the visitor center around the city. I decided to end my day in a colorful way with a short ride on a bus. I heard this place I can pick up some deals on flowers to impress the beautiful Irish ladies. So I'm heading off to Britannical Garden next and uh, I want to make the most of the day pass I bought here. That being said, let's hope the weather really clears out because I have enough of it. But that being said, have a smooth ride. The National Botanic Garden is actually only 5 kilometers away from the city center here in Dublin. The, everything you see right here used to be belong to a poet, uh, Thomas Hickel, which owns a house and uh, estate. Um, it was later in 1795 sold to the Irish Parliament, which was given over to the Loyal Dublin Society. Now, what's so impressive about this garden is it holds over 20,000 living plants as well as millions of dry specimens. The Botanical Garden is Ireland's seven most visited attraction. There are several architectural noble greenhouses that goes on forever and forever. Now I got to say, i never seen so many cactus in my life. Um, after all, this is the cactus house. Oh, maybe not. Bad idea. Yeah. Now, honestly, I have to admit, I'm actually pretty impressed with the collection here. And like, it just go room after room after room of different kind of plants they have here and honestly I, I just can't believe it's free actually this um, this attraction so honestly it got to be on your to-do list the botanical garden also home to the national herbarium and serve as a facility for horticulture research and training including breeding of many prize orchards uh, that is pretty much um, all I'm going to tell you, <laughs> but if you are really want to dig deep, there's a free walking guide tour on Sundays. A small fee is charged for a guided tour on the weekdays. I'm not sure about driving on the other side of the road. <laughs> Next morning, my Irish friend and fashion designer Emily Dawson wanted to take me somewhere really cool. She picked me up and we headed towards a Phoenix Park, also named after my own fashion designer Phoenix Park. Okay, just joking. Uh, honestly, both of them are really amazing and cool, and both have shown their collections at the New York Fashion Week. I'm going to break here and thank Phoenix for giving me the privilege to produce her official New York Fashion Week The Show for Spring Summer 2020 collection. And if you're wondering who this beautiful model is, that's Caitlin Lawrence. 
Her dream is to walk the official New York Fashion Week runway. And here she is at Pier 59. Congratulations, Kate, and love you so much, baby girl. But let's get back to <laughs> talking up the Phoenix. I mean, uh, Phoenix Park, huh? So this is a Phoenix Park. It's actually the largest enclosed public park in any of the European capitals. And it started in 1660 as a loyal hunting ground. And by 1747, it was open to the public as a park. And if you are lucky, it closed to these lovely deers. The Phoenix Park is located 4 kilometers away from the city center and north of Liffey River. The history can be traced back to the 12th century when the first Baron of Castle Rock granted a large area of land, including what is now comprised of the Phoenix Park, to the Knight Hospitaller. The Knight lost their land in 1537 following a dissolution of the monastery under Henry VIII of London. Then comes to me, <laughs> the Majesty the Charles, just joking. Uh, I mean, the restoration of Charles II of England. He granted the Duke of Ormond to establish a lawyer hunting park on the land in 1662 and opened to a public in 1747. Also within the park is a bastion, a magazine fort for those of you who want to try out some target practice. The fort was occupied by the British Armed Forces until 1922 when it was turned over to the Irish Defense Forces. The Irish Army continued to operate the site as an ammunition storage throughout the mid-20th centuries until it was fully demilitarized by the 1980s. 